Hello, Parsboro Community Radio listeners. Welcome to Exploring the Neighborhood with your hosts, Thor and Debbie, here on CICR 99.1 on your FM dial. We'd like to thank Kanza as the sponsor for our show. For those of you who are not aware, Kanza is Cumberland County's only Careers Nova Scotia Center and a vital participant in this area's road to prosperity. This year, Kanza is celebrating 15 years of serving the area and providing valuable employment and educational opportunities. Our goal for Exploring the Neighborhood is to take you on a series of half-hour adventures that include road trips, candid interviews, and commentaries. We'll focus on the area's homegrown businesses, unique landmarks, and emerging talent. We're hoping to shine a well-deserved light on the local endeavors that promote eco-friendliness and (music) self-sufficiency. On today's episode, I'll be chatting with Chris Thomas of The Groove Factory. But before we get started talking about the future, I'd like to take a step back into the past, to one small part in a very rich past of Amherst. We're talking about Amherst Pianos Limited, which had its 15 minutes of fame between 1913 and 1928. A long time ago, there was a music store mogul by the name of J.A. MacDonald. No, that's not the Prime Minister. At that time, the MacDonald Piano and Music Company was the largest music retailer in Atlantic Canada. His sales were limited only by the speed at which pianos could be acquired from the manufacturers. Since the music sales in his outlets was equal to the output of an entire piano factory, J.A. MacDonald decided to go into production for himself. With the help of some keen businessmen and investors, he raised half a million dollars. I can't help but wonder where all those guys went to. Initial production was started at the Iron Foundry building in Amherst, until the new brick building was ready. The new factory was set up to handle the raw timber supplies through to the high quality cabinet production and piano assembly. Production from the Amherst plant was quick to expand as skilled workers and industry specialists were scooped up from other companies. Although far from cheap, the Amherst brand was distributed aggressively across Canada. Sales also went to the U.S., West Indies, and the European market. The quality of the product and the constant improvements helped Amherst Piano Limited weather the impact of World War I and the Halifax explosion, and thus, it outlived most of its competition. However, a new technology soon became its downfall. J. A. MacDonald in 1925 felt that the radio fad was over and people would start buying pianos again. He might have just been a little too optimistic. The Amherst Company's boast was the best in the world. This statement was proudly displayed on the name plaque for each instrument. I am sure that it was a shock to the investors and employees alike when the market began to slide. The downturn in piano sales came from a number of factors, including the increased freight rates, the popularity of the gramophone, the advent of the radio, the movie industry, and in particular, motion pictures with sound. Plus the automobile and newly abundant roads allowed people to have the freedom of travel. It took only a couple of years to have a tremendous impact. The Amherst Piano Company closed its doors and filed for bankruptcy on September 28, 1928. No actual papers are known to exist with production numbers. However, there are numerous statements to the effect of 24 pianos and one rail car load per week. The approximate number of employees In 1913 was around 100 workers when it first started. By 1919, it had reduced the workforce down to 80, and then in 1927, there were only 68 workers left. John Anthony MacDonald, who died on December 12, 1948, was a manufacturer, financier, and a Canadian senator. 
Born and educated in Shediac, New Brunswick, he was president of Amherst Pianos Limited. He also served as vice president of Sterling Securities of Halifax and Nova Scotia Trust as well as vice president for the Colonial Brick Company of Amherst and Moncton Underwear in Moncton, New Brunswick. In 1921, he was appointed to the Canadian Senate. He sat as an independent until his death. Fast forward to today. The same building is now owned by Davy Lee Good and houses the Greasy Groove, manufacturer of high-end musical parts, as well as the Groove Factory. Amherst's most professional recording studio. Today, I get my chance to interview Mr. Chris Thomas, co-owner and chief audio engineer of the Groove Factory. We are in the recording studio, where it all happens, here in Amherst. Let's start. What is this place? Well, this place is a recording studio, like you said. It's kind of the brainchild of mine and Davy Goods. The walls are filled with guitars. It is not your average IKEA, is it? No, it's pretty kitsch. <laughs> I think that's what they say now on the uh, road show. It is rockabilly, funky, artsy, and yet macabre at the same time. But regardless, it is a cool place for a musician to hang out forget about record just hang out definitely and everybody who's come in here so far has said let's they, just hang out they just want to <laughs> they just want to hang out and make music it's, it's definitely inspires creativity in here well i mean every time i come here i grab a different guitar and i go <clears throat> he won't mind will he <laughs> don't tell davy i took this i might take this one home there's just a whole range of guitars and then there's the toys oh definitely yeah there's amps here there's bases there are bases with skeletons on them <laughs> there are posters of movies it's wild and the ceilings are high i was a man who owned recording studios you know high ceilings drums they go together yeah big um, rooms big rooms big sound love it so <laughs> We let the cat out of the bag. Describe your business. It's a local recording studio with a flair. It's a throwback or tribute to some of the cool studios that you would see in Hollywood. Some of the backroom studios that big records were made out of that looked cool. I've oh. been to some of those Hollywood studios and yeah, they have their thing, but there's a vibe here that they don't have. And that's definitely what we're shooting for is a lot of vibe. Yep, you got it. So why are you in business? You do realize that recording industry is a difficult one. This is not an easy thing to do. Definitely. Things have went downhill for the music industry for the last few years. If you don't have a passion for it, there's no use being in it. It's not something that we're here to make a million bucks on. We're here to make good music. The walls speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's passion here. And to help people make good music is kind of what we're here for as well. That is actually why I come here as well. I'm a record producer, and we're going to be working together, actually, right? Yeah. We are speaking to Chris Thomas. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be working together, and we are going to be, as a minimum, starting with the three winners of the songwriter contest that we had in conjunction with Kanza and CFTA. We are going to be recording those people here. Yeah. And they're thrilled. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be some cool projects coming out of those winners for sure. Chris Thomas, you and I have worked with a lot of great people. You've worked with a lot of people that I've worked with. But there's at least a few bands that you've worked with that I would have loved to have worked with. Why don't you tell me some of that? I worked in Toronto for a while, working on a few records and a few tracks for a few different people. I got the pleasure of working with Chris Steffler from Platinum Blonde, some remixes of some of their hits and some cool things with him. Got to work with some of my favorite punk bands, punk bands that I've listened to growing up. You're not uh, going to tell me DOA, right? Actually, it, it's a band called the Tire Kickers who used to go on tour with DOA all the time. <laughs> so you Close know, enough. We, we talked about Joey quite a bit from DOA. But yeah, no, I got to work with a lot of great people up there. I got to work with Noah Shabib, who's uh, Drake's producer now. Nice. Uh, main producer. He's mixed everybody from Eminem to Beyonce. He kind of came in to the studios working at 
not knowing anything. It was before he went away to college to learn the art of, you know, recording. And uh, he was one of the successories. And not just that, a whole slew of incredible musicians that nobody's ever heard of. Definitely, yeah. Except other musicians. Exactly. Lots of those. And then, to be honest, a lot of those are, you know, better than the big names I've worked with. (laughs) You've also had the pleasure of working with a few known people around here. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've worked with Mike King from Spring Hill, Chris Brown from Spring Hill. I've worked with a lot of guys from Amherst here. Done basically any genre you can think of in the town of Amherst. I've kind of had my hands on in one form or the other. Very cool. So how long has this studio been here? We had our grand opening in the summer. It was just a rundown factory, obviously, uh, before we kind of put it together. So we spent... It's not just a rundown factory. It used to be the Amherst Piano Factory. I wasn't dismissing that. (laughs) I was saying that the state of the building and even the rooms that we're in now, the state of those were pretty rundown. The factory itself has an amazing history of music, producing Amherst pianos from 1912 to 1928. It's kind of Amherst's claim to fame for music was to produce these these fine pianos. And it's still an incredible building. Regardless, the immensity of this building and the history is not lost. Yeah, and the coolness factor. You just walk into any part of this building and you instantly say, wow. The old parts of the building where it still looks like it did in 1912, you'll say, wow, because it's just a really cool building. Chris, why don't you tell me a little bit about how you and Davey ended up coming up with the idea What brought you two together, and then what made you go into the insanity of building a recording studio? Well, I've always recorded out of my house. I worked in studios in Amherst and in Toronto. I came back here to Amherst, and I started playing in a band, and our guitar player knew Davey and somehow got us hooked up with rehearsing here at the factory. And as soon as I walked in, I saw the potential of this place being a great recording studio. Me being kind of a shy guy, I beat around the bush a little bit to Davy's daughter and said, hey, you should tell Davy that I'm into recording and I'd love to do something with the space. You know, I obviously got the, ask him yourself. You know, ask him yourself. <laughs> Going through the daughter doesn't work. I yeah. got one of my own. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, with a little bit of a push, talked to him and came to the table with a pretty cool idea, I think, and he seemed really on board with it. Dave's just got a passion for music, so when he meets someone else who's passionate about music, he kind of lights a fire and starts a spark of all these ideas, and we decided to give it a shot, and it started to snowball. We only intended to finish one of the rooms, and then we'll have just a cool control room in one room studio, but one room led to another and into another, into finishing this, painting this, and really, like, making it a nice spot. I hope that by this time next year that your studio is absolutely packed. I know I'm going to be here as often as I can. Yeah, we appreciate it. Now that you have a studio in Amherst, Nova Scotia, where are you going to get your clients from? Who do you see coming here? With the state of the music industry, it's one of those things that everybody has the ability to record now. So everybody has GarageBand or a small interface or you can plug into your laptop and you can make decent sounding records. We want to get a name out there for ourselves and make it a venue where people feel like they could come here as an extension to what they can do at home. There's nothing worse than recording yourself on a laptop. There's no inspiration behind that. You're sitting there, you press play, you have to kind of keep an eye on things, you have to do everything yourself. We're hoping that people will see there is a little more they can accomplish here than what they can do at home. And once people see that, hopefully word of mouth will start bringing in more people, attracting people from outside of the Amherst area, you know, into Moncton, into Halifax, and even further than that. There's already been interest through the rockabilly scene with Davey from people in Halifax and St. John, and even down in the States who just know his credibility and may want to come up here and take advantage of the studio. You've got this really cool studio. Now, how the heck are you going to get people to come here and record? The building itself and the actual atmosphere that we created here, we've got something kind of unique, especially unique to the East Coast, something that's not as clinical as other studios. And you can walk into some studios and you see them almost as... Are you talking some cool, dirty sound? 
Yeah. That's yeah. my favorite. Yeah, for sure. Obviously, we're working towards more of an analog type sound here. Our plans are to get into some more analog gear, get into maybe some tape machines to get things you know, kind of back to the old way of doing it. I'll bring all my toys in. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> So how do people become aware of your studio? Where do they get to know about it? Well, right now we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We've got a website that'll be launching here probably in the next couple months that'll have links to sound clips, gear lists, emails, and how to book and how to get a hold of us for booking sessions or just give us a call. I love showing off the studio. Davey loves showing off the studio. If somebody wants to pop in and just take a look around, talking about how cool this place is, just come down. We'll show it to you. Hit a drum in the room and see what it sounds like. Super. I think your doors are going to be knocking. <laughs> yeah. we're, hoping, we're hoping they're rocking. <laughs> rocking and knocking. <laughs> Where the heck did you guys get the funding to put this all together? Because, I mean, that's one of the keys to starting a business. And this is a business show. Where'd you guys get the money? Davey's collected a lot of things over years of playing. I've collected a lot of gear. So it's just a basically a collaborative offering of you put resources. your toys together we basically combined toys in the sandbox and created a pretty wicked spot so you didn't go to any banks or anything like that no. strictly out of your own pocket yeah we didn't we didn't get any funding through factor or anything like that to get this this place no happening. business development bank nothing like that nothing's just straight out of uh straight out of us anything that needed to be built we built it you're not the first to say that and it's quite surprising in an area that needs new businesses to hear that most of the business people we talk to it's come out of their own pocket, out of their own savings. It makes you wonder sometimes. The management, how does it work here? Who's the boss? Who sweeps the floors? Basically, that would be me. I come in, I vacuum, mop, clean. And if you call in to book a session, it's me answering the phone, running the board. It's me unplugging the mics at the end of the session. I'm kind of here in the morning and leave late at night. Get Slave to your work. It, pretty much. Yeah. I love it. What's the future? Future, hopefully, is lots of bookings and a lot of great music coming out of Cumberland County area. Hopefully, we can get some major projects happening in here. We've got talks of doing everything from seminars to lessons to possibly even a small venue here. So I think the future is pretty bright and pretty big for the factory here. So we got to wear shades, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> if something happened to you and Davey, what would happen to the business? It would just be here. Davey's wife would take over. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Actually, <laughs> Kim, Davey's daughter, is a great engineer. She could probably come in here and handle everything herself. Yeah. Continuity built in. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Is there anything else you would like to tell our listeners? I just want to say, come check the place out. Thamers, uh, there's a lot of musicians in this town, and there's a lot of musicians that I think would really enjoy having a space like this just to experience it. A lot of people around here have never been in a pro studio. And I say pro because most of the gear that I have here is of the professional quality and professional grade. It's not your small interface that you're buying at local music store. It's some pretty high end stuff. So yeah. I want people to come in and experience that and see what we have to offer them. And I'm sure they'll be pleasantly surprised. I always say that when you can get a preamp for a couple of bucks and then you have to pay a thousand dollars for the same thing, you're getting something for the thousand dollars, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. People don't understand the differences in uh, audio equipment. There's a reason why, you know, we've collected some of the gear that we have. And it has a sound. You know, the sound that we get in here is kind of unique and unique to Nova Scotia, unique to the East Coast. And hopefully the music kind of stands out and kind of rises above. A professional studio has at least three thousand dollars for every channel. Yeah. A thousand dollars in the mic, a thousand dollars in the preamp and a thousand dollars in some form of outboard gear, including compressor. And that's been the model for a lot of pro studios for a long time. There's a reason why they were pro studios. There's a reason for it, because if you don't, if you don't, your sound falls short. It definitely does. Yeah. There's a lot of equipment on the market that you can do amazing jobs with. But if you wanted to kind of take it to the higher level, then you kind of got to get in and get some of that good analog gear on that audio. Who are your competitors around here? 
the main competitors, I guess, I call them bedroom warriors. The guys who are tracking. Like me, the guy with the Mac. The guy with the Mac, the guy with GarageBand, the guy with Cubase. I am your competition. Yeah, exactly. I'm not. It's those guys. And I was one of those guys when I came back from Toronto. I don't want to compete with them. I want to work with them. It's hard to record a drum kit in your apartment at two in the morning, but I can record a drum kit here at two in the morning. I think I'd hear gunshots if I record a drum kit at my place. Exactly. <laughs> two in the morning. So there's, uh, there's always a time and a place where you can crank an amp and it's not usually in your apartment and we can do that here so we can work hand in hand with those guys and make things happen what are the negative challenges that you have to overcome in this business the readily available technology that people have at their fingertips makes the professional recording studio seem less as a need for a lot of people it seems like they don't need to go to the big studio now. They don't have to go into a space like this. They don't. They can demo it a lot they, cheaper they is what you're saying. They can demo it a lot cheaper and they can put that demo directly to iTunes and they have an album out. If they can record at home and go directly to iTunes, wouldn't it make sense for this studio eventually to become a record company? Definitely. And that's one of the things we are toying with. We're getting into and have the ability to get into everything from band merchandising, t-shirts, CDs, banners, stickers, all of those things. We're getting into duplication. You know, eventually we're going to be putting out records out of here. That we, would be a good idea. We want to get into doing compilations, you know, artists that come and work here. We want to promote those artists. We want to try to make a community of musicians that rises above everybody else. So when someone says, hey, have you heard of blah, blah, blah from Cumberland County, that someone in Toronto is like, yeah, I've heard of that guy. I've bought that compilation that he's on. I've seen his stuff on iTunes. I've seen his stuff. That's like what Sloan did in Halifax. One stop shopping. Yeah, and that's eventually where we want to evolve to. You come in, you record your record here, you press your record here, we distribute your record here. And at the end of the day, everything's kind of done in-house. You don't have to worry about it. Where do I sign? That was Chris Thomas from The Groove Factory here in Amherst. It's a pleasure having talked to you. Yeah, thanks and so much. I hope we keep doing business together. That'd be great. So we are back from the studio, The Groove Factory. And I'm sitting here with Debbie, and uh, she has some questions for me. Yeah, so Thor, if someone wants to record a song or album, how do they get started? That's a really good question. Most people nowadays have some form of recording at home, usually on computer, GarageBand, Fruity Loops. There's all kinds of programs that allow you to record things. Some people have iPhones. Now, if they wanted to do some of the recordings themselves, what would they need? Usually the best thing for an artist to have at home is a decent quality microphone. There are good quality microphones nowadays starting anywhere from around $100 to $500. And they also need some form of recording program on computer. Well, how much should they plan on spending to get a decent recording. If they have their own gear, then the additional cost would be studio costs for drums and vocals, as I mentioned, plus the mix down. I mean, for a decent studio, they should project anywhere from a couple of hundred to a thousand dollars a song. Now, let's talk about what it's going to be used for. If it's strictly a demo, a couple of hundred dollars should do the trick. So once they have the recording, what next? Once they have their recording, it's a good idea for them to check audience response. Best off to start with their friends and people they know. If they get a positive response, it's not a bad idea for them to try local community radio stations, college stations, see if they get good feedback from that. And hopefully become famous. And hopefully become famous. So what have we been up to lately? Driving. Driving. And I have been under the weather. I've been sick for a bit, haven't I? Yep. And we've been moving forward regardless, haven't we? We sure have. In the car. In <laughs> driving. The car. In the car <laughs> driving. Yes, today we went to Truro and beyond. We had a little errand to do in Truro. There's a wonderful restaurant in Truro that we always like. Nook and Cranny. Nook and Cranny, that's it. That's the one. 
They have an excellent choice of beverages. Beer. Appetizers, yes. What did we eat there last time that was so amazing? Oh, the shredded pork poutine. Oh, God. That was evil. And what else do we have? Do you remember? I had a hamburger. It was excellent. I would go back. We took the scenic route to Windsor. We did, all along the coast. Is it a lady that has a goat farm? And I got hooked up with some soap making supplies. And we put in an order for some of her goats. Yep. Why did we put in an order for some goats? Because we are going to need goats on our farm. We got a farm. We didn't tell anyone yet. No. Nope. We did get a little farm out near Joggins River Heber. But let's move on. And I also tried to get two old amplifiers repaired at AM Music in Windsor. Windsor. And the trip was absolutely lovely. The ice on Bay of Fundy was unbelievable. Spectacular. The ice. It was crazy wonderful. We took a lot of pictures. It was a beautiful drive. It was. Amherst, the closing of Dales, we missed that. We did. We, we talked about it so much. Time just flew by so fast. and We have been so busy, it's crazy. And yet we missed Dales. Dales was to be our special shopping spree that never happened. It's really sad that that building is closed. It is. There's a lot of buildings, actually, that are... I would say underused in the Amherst area. Vacant. Vacant. And that's sort of sad. We were also at the Armory this week. Yep. We were there for the launch of the African Heritage Month, which the mayor of Amherst uh, dedicated. Yes. And uh, signed the proclamation. I mean, there were so many people there. There were mayors and ministers from Nova Scotia, Tony Ince, right, the Honorable Minister, MLAs. There was lots of people. Yeah, it was a really nice outcome. Yep, we were actually there filming. Yes. We got to see the armory, though, afterwards. That was fun. Yeah, the museum was awesome. I had no idea it even existed. And they say that stays empty so often. That's such a shame. It is really a beautiful historical museum. I plan to interview the curator soon, Ray Colson, and I'd like to take a tour of that armory one more time. It's uh, quite a collection of historical artifacts. Okay, time has run out. When it comes to local business, arts, crafts, and entertainment, We'll try our best to provide a global perspective on our community and remind listeners that where one regularly chooses to spend their money is often much more powerful than the occasional vote at the ballot box. So, help out your talented neighbors and enjoy the unique diversity of what Cumberland, Westmoreland has to offer. And ultimately, you'll be helping yourself. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. So, tune in next week for another episode of Exploring the Neighborhood with your hosts, Thor and Debbie, here on CICR 99.1 on your FM dial.